I don't know if you'll know this, but in America, the internet infrastructure is much better than that of even the United Kingdom. You see, 4G internet is readily available, and Wi-Fi is quite often free in public places. Martin Luther King Plaza in San Francisco is one such place. Right now, there's a homeless man living there with his name is Jesse. What Jesse's doing is trying to earn a little bit of money to help his food stamps go the rest of the month. He's not doing that by begging or busking. He's actually using the Wi-Fi to mine a virtual currency called Bitcoin. And he's doing this by watching videos, earning himself about 60 cents a day. You see, if we take this to its fullest potential, we can say computing is like an endless stream of money with the internet the way in which to share that. You see, I truly do believe that the internet is awesome. And I don't think it's easy to say why something so awesome should be for the many and not for the few. So over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about just why I think the internet is so great. I'm going to go over a few of the major milestones that's got the internet to where it is today. The first milestone is when the internet went mainstream. The internet went mainstream in the 1970s, when the actual internet was first created. In the 1970s, the first email was sent. And that wasn't the moment when the internet went mainstream. Later on, a brilliant man called Tim Berners-Lee came along and he came up with the idea of the World Wide Web. He handed his paper of how the World Wide Web would be to his managers at CERN. And later, when this paper was found, just scribble across the top of it was vague but exciting. And I think that's a brilliant way to sum up what the web is. In the 1990s, Tim built, this, built what he called his World Wide Web and we got this. You can argue that this is the moment that people first be able to see what the web was. The next milestone is actually the moment that the internet came home. I don't mean this in an ET come home kind of way. I mean the moment that we got the internet available to us in our house. This obviously came along with dial-up. And dial-up came with its own theme tune. And this is a horribly lovely noise. And it brings back so many emotions to me. One of, I won't let you listen to it all. <laughs> the first emotion it brings back is the joy of the first time I could see this web thing and see what the internet really was about. The second emotion is probably frustration. One, at that horrendous tune, and two, at how slow and, and it, how encompassed the phone line as well. I mean, you had to choose between getting a line or using your telephone. The next major milestone for the internet then was quite obvious, which is broadband. Now, broadband was simple. Split the phone line up, meaning that we got faster internet and we could use our telephone at the same time. But what it actually meant, and probably more importantly than both of these things, was that we got an always-on feel. See, that's what broadband gave us. You could now open up your laptop or your computer and you'd be online straight away. And this is arguably the moment when the internet became part of our everyday lives. So the next major milestone is the moment that the internet became everywhere. And you see, what I'm talking about here is the moment that the internet was available to you in your pocket. We got a first attempt at this with something called WAP, which not many of you probably would have heard of. You see, what WAP was was a terrible, butchered up version of what the web was that we were used to seeing on our desktop and on our computers. So it's quite clear, in June 2007, we got this, the iPhone. And the iPhone changed everything. See, the iPhone brought the same web that you were used to seeing on your computer to your pockets, meaning that you could see exactly that same web. And it was the start of a revolution. As a web developer, I quite often get asked for, by people saying, how would this look on a mobile device? But at the time of the iPhone, all people were asking was, how would this look like on my iPhone? This was because the iPhone was truly the start of a mobile revolution, which has got us to where we are today. I think it's very easy to forget that while we have an internet everywhere, we don't actually quite have an internet for everyone. And I think that's what we should be aiming for next. So the next milestone I think we should be heading towards is an internet for everyone. You see, the fact that we can get online wherever we are today means that we can quite easily forget that the internet is available to so few worldwide. I think the number you'll find quite shocking is that only 44% of the world can get online. This means that it's the equivalent to saying that six, only the six largest countries have access to the internet. Or like saying four billion people can't get online, which is a staggering number. So I think the one thing we should be doing is making the web a human right. And it's only by doing this that we'll be able to make a, a dent in this number and actually increase this to where we should be today. Okay, so I'm saying this is quite a big thing. Make the web a human right. Obviously, I'm not saying that the internet is as important as food or water. What I'm saying is, for us to be truly equal, we should be able to give this catalyst for people to improve themselves to everybody. So let's talk about some of the reasons why I think the internet is so amazing. The internet is awesome 
least of all because it is our platform in which to share. It allows us to share everything from jobs for people being able to get to jobs that they would no longer, no, no, not otherwise be able to get to, to sharing information about agriculture so we can get a better crop for everybody, or by allowing people to attend education, or by allowing people to see health information online, although I wouldn't go about trusting it all. One way I think this is very important is the, the way that we can share ideas. We have a website called Kickstarter, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. The idea behind Kickstarter is simple. People share ideas Normal people share their ideas and they're backed by other normal people. Kickstarter has come up with some great things, from cheaper 3D printing to a heart rate monitor that sits in the end of your finger to things like card games. Some of these are crazy and some of them aren't great, but we wouldn't get the best ones without the power of the internet. Kickstarter has raised over 1.1 billion pounds since it started, and I think that's an amazing toll. It also allows us to share wealth. It does this for a th a through a few websites. One of them is a little-known website called Kiva. The idea behind Kiva is a bit different to your traditional website. The idea is that people can donate or lend $25 a time to people around the world. It's quite a hard thing to wrap your head around, so I'll give you an example. Say, for instance, we've got a farmer living in Bolivia. This farmer has two cows. He uses these cows every year to, to mow his field. This means that he, this is the way that he earns his money. Now say one year, one of his cows unfortunately dies of old age, meaning that now he can only plough his field at half the speed. This farmer could go on to Kiva and apply for a loan to get himself, say, a tractor. And with this tractor, he can now plough his field 10 times as fast, earning himself 10 times the profit. And with that profit, he can use that to pay back his Kiva loan. You see, Kiva works on the back of the fact that people don't want handouts, and I think it's an amazing tool. The internet also allows us to share knowledge. One such way it allows us to do this is through education. Now, it's a number that no, a lot of you probably won't be shocked by because it's said a lot, but it is a shocking number that only one in three children have access to education. And I think online courses could help to completely change this figure. But wouldn't it be great if a teacher could step into a classroom anywhere around the world? Or if kids could be taken out of any classroom and onto a field trip straight away? This is exactly what Skype in the classroom are trying to do. Skype in the classroom's idea is exactly that. Children are allowed to get out of the classroom to anyone that's got a webcam, anyone can get involved, or teachers around the world can step into any classroom to help teach a lesson. It's a great idea, only made possible through the internet. We've got a problem with doctors worldwide as well. We don't have enough of them, and they're not always in the places we need to be. Imagine a world where doctors could be anywhere at any point, or that we could make sure they were scheduled in the places they need to be. Take, for instance, rural Africa, for instance, where people can travel for hours at a time to get to a doctor. This is something that Virtual Doctors is looking to solve. Virtual Doctors is a great idea. The idea behind it is that people can go and see remote healthcare workers in Africa. And these healthcare workers are collected online, meaning that they can help diagnose the patients in their own communities, meaning that people don't have to make these long treks anymore. But the best part of Virtual Doctors is when a patient comes along and the doctor can't diagnose them there and then straight away, they can upload the file and photos to do with, this, to do with the patient to the cloud, meaning that a doctor in the UK can help diagnose these patients. This helps save lives right now, and it also helps to train the, the staff in Africa. It's a great tool. So you're all on my side. We're all agreeing the internet is great. Let's just give it to everybody. Obviously, that's not the case. There are some things holding us back. Let's take a look at some of them now. The first one is cost. Now, it would probably be quite surprising if I tell you that actually the devices to get online are actually generally more, more cheaper than the price of getting online. Take, for instance, in the US. Facebook have done a study and worked out that the cost of an iPhone contract, three quarters of that is your data to get online, and only one quarter of that is actually the device, which is a staggering proportion. The guys at Facebook, again, have come up with the idea of the internet.org. Now, what the internet.org is, is giving free internet to specific websites chosen by local communities and local governments. It's a great tool. It means that people around the world who would otherwise not be able to access the internet at all can now see, albeit a small glimpse of the internet, but still the web itself. Now, this has come up with a bit of scrutiny, and people have uh, labelled this as being anti-net neutrality. Net neutrality, by the way, is the idea that governments and, and operators don't slow down specific websites, meaning that accessing the first website should be easy as accessing the second. Now, on the face of it, this is exactly what the internet.org is going against. 
but really, these are people that otherwise wouldn't be able to get online at all. So can we say this is a bad thing? I think the internet.org is amazing, personally, and I'm completely behind it. Although I do see it as a temporary solution to this problem. The other problem we've got is infrastructure. Infrastructure is really interesting. And depending on who you talk to, depend, and what sort of population density you're looking at, you solve it in a completely different way. So traditionally, the way we would solve infrastructure is through satellite towers. Now, these towers would be hoisted up at vast expense, meaning that they can solve our medium to high population density areas. And the reason they're so expensive is because, firstly, we need the land rights to be able to put the tower. Then we need to be able to build the tower. Then we need to be able to power the tower and connect it to the internet. It's quite a big chunk. And obviously, this means that telephone companies can only recoup the cost of this by putting them in these medium to high areas, which is why a lot of rural UK areas still don't have things like 4G and fibre internet. So we need some tech giants to come along and help us solve this. And luckily we've got that in the form of Google. Google have come up with an idea which sounds mental. The idea is balloon-powered internet. It's called Project Loon, and the idea is that these balloons stay in the air for up to 100 days at a time, and they're flying around 20 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, so that's above weather and planes. The idea is these can propagate internet to a 40 kilometer square area. I think this is amazing. And I think you'll be shocked when I tell you that this isn't something in the future. This is actually something that's being tested in New Zealand right now with really good results. You see, the way this works is by always keeping one balloon above you as the next one's leaving, which has a lot of complications to it. And obviously, how do you steer balloons? So Google have come up with a really interesting idea. They actually move these balloons up or down, meaning that they can catch different wind, speed, different wind heading in different directions. And they steer themselves a bit like a sailboat. I only see this as a temporary solution, and I see a more permanent solution coming in the form of drones. Now, these drones will be able to solve the medium to high population density areas. And the reason why it's that is because they're going to circle one area, propagating internet down. These will be able to fly for months at a time because they're completely solar powered, which is really, really exciting. Facebook last year bought a company called Accentra, which is a UK-based drone making company. And although this sounds like something far-fetched and in the future, they've actually been testing these of the UK this year, of March this year, which is really exciting. Now, obviously, these drones are much bigger than the ones in this photo. And actually, they've got the wingspan of a Boeing 737. But they actually have the same weight as a car. The technology in these things is incredible. Now, what's better than when we've got one tech giant fighting is when we've got two tech giants trying to be the first at something. That's when we always get things much, much faster. And we've had it this time in the form of Google. Google have come up with, Google have bought a company called Titan Aerospace, meaning that they're taking on this from the American state. Titan Aerospace is an American-based drone-making company as well. So it means that we've got these two tech giants forming this, they're trying to fight this same battle. Google have been testing this in America at the moment and are gonna be testing this up until September. So by the end of this year, we can see some really interesting progress on this front. Okay, so that's the medium to high population density areas. But what about the low population? SpaceX have come up with an idea for this. And their idea probably sounds on par as crazy as all the rest, but I think it's really exciting. The idea is to put 4,000 satellites 1,100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. This will form a mesh around the, the whole world, meaning that we'll be able to get internet to everybody. I wish I could say this was being tested right now, but unfortunately it's not. But SpaceX have said that in the next five years, they could have the first iteration of this, and in a further 10, we could have the final iteration. The final iteration could be one gigabyte per second internet access for everybody on Earth, which is a really, really exciting thing to think about. SpaceX have quite often been compared to taking on challenges that other companies would just be terrified to. And I think you could say they've done this again. In fact, Elon Musk, the CEO, compared this as like rebuilding the internet in space. Okay, I'll say it again. The internet is awesome. I truly do believe it is a tool that can absolutely change lives, change the way people think, and empower people to do some amazing things. But none of the things I've said so far are really what make it so great. So what is? It's people. People's thoughts and ideas and opinions going into the internet are what make it so great. And I think that that is why we should be pushing to make the web a human right. And I think we have a choice, and that choice is simple to me. 
It only takes one generation to look back at the previous generation and think they're absolutely insane. So wouldn't it be amazing if the next generation could look back at ours now and just go, how were they not always connected? I'd love to be part of that generation that brought the world the internet. So I want to quote Tim Berners-Lee when I say, this is for everybody. Let's make it that way. Thank you.